The COVID pandemic has resulted in over 35 million Americans becoming infected and over 600,000 people dying. Vaccines developed in record time are helping to control the pandemic and hopefully ending it soon. Yet millions of Americans are skeptical. They think the vaccine development program was too fast, or the side effects are too serious and it's too risky, or they just don't know who to believe. I sat down with Dr. William Gruber. He's Pfizer's Senior Vice President of Vaccine Clinical Research and Development, where he took on these issues as well as addressed the questions that are most on your mind. I want to talk about vaccination in kids under 12. Yeah. Where is Pfizer on these trials in kids less than 12? It's been previously announced that you expect to submit data sometime in the fall. Dr. Fauci mm -hmm. recently said he doesn't expect any vaccination in kids under 12 till midwinter. I'm not sure what that counts <laughs> yeah. as. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the timeline for vaccination in kids because parents want to know what is the fall going to look like. Yeah, so we take obviously a very deliberate and serious approach, just as we do for any population, particularly in children, to assure safety and efficacy or an immune response that's likely to predict efficacy of the vaccine. So we took a very deliberate approach, recognizing that for the mRNA vaccines, there was some tendency to have more reactions in terms of local reactions at the site of injection or systemic reactions such as fever or chills um, in younger age groups. And so we were very deliberate when we, for instance, began with the 12 to 15 year olds. We basically started off with a small number of those individuals to assure ourselves that the safety profile at the 30 microgram dose, which we use in older individuals, would be safe and effective. And it was, and fortunately we were gratified that not only did we prove uh, that uh, the vaccine had a safety uh, and tolerability profile uh, and an efficacy profile in the end uh, that supported its use, but it gave us then some confidence, okay, you know, we can take this deliberate approach as we move down. With the recognition though, that as we move down to younger age, that maybe we would actually do just as well with a lower dose. I and mean, part of that was driven by the fact that once we had the 12 to 15 year old data, we actually saw that the antibody responses, again, this marker that we think helps predict the likelihood that the vaccine is gonna be effective in the 12 to 15 year olds was actually higher than what we saw in even 16 to 25 year olds. So in, in that circumstance, it said, okay, well, we can actually you know, potentially further minimize the local and systemic reactions we see with the vaccine by starting at a lower dose. So we began to look, you know, first at 3, 10, 30 micrograms in these younger populations. So populations between 5 and 11, between 2 and 4, almost 5 years of age, and 6 months to 2 years of age, and very deliberately moved down in age with uh, low doses and, uh, and determining what would be the highest dose that would give us the appropriate sort of safety profile and get us the appropriate sort of immune response and vice versa, the lowest dose that would basically give us that and then work down in age very deliberately. We did that with small numbers of individuals, came up with an appropriate dose uh, for the youngest uh, individuals, which worked out to be uh, 10 micrograms for uh, the five to 11 year olds and uh, three micrograms for six months uh, to four year olds and have now moved to expanded populations to enlarge our ability to examine the safety as well as the immune response to that vaccine, which by the way, we're also capturing cases on the, uh, the chance that we will actually be able to demonstrate efficacy as part of those trials. And we think that body of information will then lend itself to being confident about the safety profile uh, as well as the ability to provide protection that we would anticipate to file. Uh, and of course, winter comes early in the Northeast. So I'm thinking, you know, uh, we're still, I think, targeting the October timeframe. Okay. Obviously there will be deliberation that occurs after that from the FDA and ultimately from the ACIP to make recommendations, the advisory committee on immunization practice of the CDC. Uh, but I, I, you know, I am optimistic uh, that before the end of this year, we will actually have an emergency use authorization if all goes well in terms of the safety and uh, immune response profile. Well, the FDA did announce that it would go to an advisory committee as opposed to the 12 through 17 uh, authorization 
did not. So we'll, we'll have to see. But you expect to file something in October. Yeah, yeah. That's our current plan. Let's talk about um, the outcomes that are measured that you referenced to. Because in the adult population, we did look at cases in, in terms of symptomatic cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. This was a primary endpoint for approval. For children under 12, that would be very difficult, would it not? Because cases, although they occur, do not occur as often. You're actually conducting the trial at a time. We're actually seeing improvements in vaccination rates. So how do we know for sure that it meets the safety and efficacy standard for children who many people argue are developing their immune systems, there's some unpredictability um, based on that. How do we feel confident that yeah. we know that it's safe and effective for kids under 12? Yeah, so I, th I think, first of all, I would go to the precedent for other vaccines where we've developed them often in adults and moved down to children and shown that the safety profiles and, and immune response profiles and efficacy profiles in, in adults and working down to children has reliably predicted uh, the safety profile in young children. And then, as I mentioned before, as, uh, presuming we get emergency use authorization, um, the story is not over there for us, nor is the work done. We continue in a post-licensure environment to capture information in, in that population of children to better document the nature of the full comprehensive safety profile uh, and the potential for efficacy in that setting. You're right, and with these small numbers, we may or may not be able to demonstrate efficacy uh, in the course of the current trials. But again, we don't want to hold hostage the potential to really uh, provide um, an important benefit to children, to allow them to go back to school, to be able to resume normal activities, to allow families to essentially not worry about the potential for spread from that child into the home or that child ending up uh, ill enough to end in the hospital. So I think it's really that balance. And we've worked uh, very um, rigorously with the FDA uh, to uh, be able to evaluate the, the nature of the immune response to be confident that the immune response that we in children, uh, based on what we've seen in efficacy in other populations, uh, that that immune response will likely predict the same level of efficacy. And of course, then the safety profile you know, will speak for itself in terms of the common reactions, uh, as well as as the numbers increase, the, the, the rare reactions. But we know that the incidence in kids less than 12 is on the low side. We do know when they get it, it's less severe. Granted, some children have died uh, in this age group of COVID. There are some people out there saying it shouldn't qualify for emergency use based on the definition of a public health emergency in that age group. What do you say to those persons who say, Dr. Gruber, we need to wait, and I don't want my kids to be one of the first people to get it? How do you reassure them? Yeah, well, I think the best example I can give is what we do in the clinical trials because they're the first people to actually line up. And I will say that, you know, they're, they're perhaps more so for than uh, for most any other pediatric trial I've done, there is pent up demand. For, in fact, we have more people volunteering for trials than actually we can accommodate in the trial. Now, why is that? I think it's because of, of a number of things. Number one, there is a recognition that as time goes on, as we have become more and more successful in preventing adult disease, the only individuals we're likely to see are going to be the unvaccinated, uh, which includes children, right? And so they will, you know, and we already know, I mean, and you can hear from ACIP members, uh, you know, when they've talked about the, the need for a, a pediatric vaccine. So I think there's pent-up demand to uh, essentially help the child themselves and reduce uh, that risk of hospitalization. But also just the notion of freeing up children so they can go back to school. There's been a great loss, I think, in the past year, and I think you hear this from pediatricians and individuals involved in education, where many children are now behind because of the virtual sorts of learning environments that they were subject to uh, during the past year. It's important to have children back in school, and one of the best mechanisms to make that possible is to provide protection to them so they cannot uh, you know, spread, uh, either experience the uh, uh, disease themselves or spread it to others. Uh, 
Um, it's important for children at all ages. And, you know, if you think about it, it's not just the educational aspects, it's the social aspects. It's the ability to engage, you know, and thinking particularly of adolescence in terms of sports activities, sure. drama club, the other sorts of things that enrich uh, uh, children's lives and help them develop. So I would say... Were you in drama club? Uh, no, but I was in debate. <laughs> but uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, the notion is that, that uh, we need to get back and out of our cocoons. It's been liberating for adults to be removed from many of the restrictions that we've all had to endure over the past year. Uh, how can it be any more important uh, in adults than it is in children? It's going to be incredibly important to do that for children. And finally, what do you say to viewers? You say, Dr. Gruber, what you said is great, but I'm still just not sure. So I would say get as much information as you can. Talk to individuals that you trust to give you good guidance, whether it's uh, clergymen, your physician, community leaders, and um, learn the facts and make a decision. And I think on balance, if you do that, you know, you'll make a decision that the vaccine is right for you. That's good advice. Dr. Gruber, thanks for taking the time today. Okay. Thank you.